Father God, we do praise you. We thank you for all of the good works that you have done for us. Uh, Lord, we thank you for the salvation that you have accomplished for us uh, through your uh, foreordination, through sending your son Jesus to die on the cross and to rise again for our atonement and justification and for the spirit applying it all to our lives and then sanctifying us into the image of Christ himself. Lord, we thank you for all of these great gifts, and we thank you for your word that you have given to us, this divine revelation to teach us and instruct us uh, in who you are and what you have commanded us to do and what our duty is to you and what to believe. And so, Lord, we praise you for these great gifts, and we ask that as we look at your word, that you would apply it to our hearts and help us to now uh, then go out our separate ways, uh, all the more sanctified, unto your glory. For we ask it in the good name of Jesus. Amen. All right, well, as it says up here on the slide, we're going to be looking at Revelation chapter 2, verses 1 through 7 today. So if you have your Bibles, I would invite you to open them up to this text, this New Testament uh, passage of Revelation chapter 2, verses 1 through 7, which is actually going to begin the section of Revelation that is now going to start to work through the specific addresses that are made to the seven churches of Revelation. And that's going to cover chapters 2 and 3, which we'll be looking at now over the next couple of weeks. Um, but before we actually jump into that, uh, just by, again, way of quick recap of what we have been examining these last several weeks from chapter 1 in Revelation. Uh, there's obviously a lot that we could say by, by way of recap, but just remember that when we come to the book of Revelation itself, that we have to keep in mind what it literally says in chapter 1, verse 1, that this is a revelation of Jesus Christ. Hence why the book is called Revelation, uh, and it tells us from the very get-go that the Lord Jesus is in fact revealing something to us. That he's not primarily concealing or hiding something secret, uh, but rather he's revealing it to us. And, uh, but as it also says in verse 1, which is not always as clear in every English translation, but uh, he, is, he is revealing something through the use of signs and symbols. He's signifying it unto John, it says. And that is why Revelation also has a lot more uh, kind of what we would even think of as bizarre imagery, though it's not bizarre ultimately, but it's, it's unusual and, and different to us, uh, because that's what he tells us. He's using signs and symbols to reveal something, and that something that he is revealing supremely in this book is the judgment that is going to come upon the nation of Israel for their apostasy, for their sin and rebellion, and ultimately for their breach of covenant, uh, for piercing Jesus, the Messiah, it says in chapter 1, verse 7. Uh, and just as the covenant that the Lord had made with Israel stipulated in chapter 26 of Leviticus or 28 of Deuteronomy, that if they breached the covenant, then judgment would come. And so that's exactly what they did. They rejected Jesus, the Messiah. That was kind of like the culmination of the breach of covenant. And therefore, judgment is coming upon them. And this judgment was going to happen very soon because the time was near, as John keeps warning about in chapter 1, verse 1, chapter 1, verse 3. And then he warns throughout the rest of the book as well. Right? This event, he says, is very, very soon to happen. And uh, so that's what the whole book of Revelation we are arguing is about. This judgment that is about to very soon happen upon Israel. And as we have been arguing, that that judgment then ultimately was fulfilled in the year A.D. 70, in the first century, when after the Jews tried to revolt against Rome for a time, the Romans came in, they surrounded the city of Jerusalem, they destroyed the city, they destroyed the temple, and they killed 1.1 million of the Jews at that time. It was just an absolute slaughter, and it was a great tribulation. And so, that event that happened back in the first century is what we're arguing. The book of Revelation is actually prophetically describing. And so when John wrote it, when he was given this revelation and he wrote it down, these events that are recorded were yet future to him. They hadn't happened yet, but now for us in the 21st century, uh, these events have now already been happened. They've transpired already back in the first century. And so again, that's what we have been arguing the book of Revelation is about. And as it said uh, in chapter 1, verse 11, the Lord Jesus then commands John to write these things to the eleven churches, or the seven churches, in Asia Minor. Those were the churches of Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. These are the seven churches that he is instructed to write to, not only to warn them about these very soon-to-happen events over in Jerusalem, but then to also encourage them in the faith and to hold fast in the faith, in light of the Roman persecution they were already undergoing quite severely at this time in the 1860s when he's writing. 
And so, again, that's what, uh, that's what he is told to do in chapter 1. And so now in chapter 2 and 3, he's going to specifically, the Lord Jesus, through John, is addressing these seven churches. So, without further ado, if you please rise as we read our text for this morning. It's again going to be chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. And this is the word of the Lord. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, The words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be false. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary. But I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. Repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. Yet this you have. You hate the works of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Thus ends the reading of God's word. May he write it on our hearts by faith. Thanks be to God. Amen. You may be seated. All right, so that is the passage of Scripture that we're going to look at for this morning. And as we were just mentioning prior to reading it, uh, this begins the addresses to all of the seven churches. And it is this first church that is being addressed is the church of Ephesus. So that's what we're going to look at for this morning. Um, and as we do, as we look at this one, and as we look at the next several churches, uh, I will note at the very outset that all of the addresses themselves follow the same basic pattern or outline, uh, and that is this. Uh, the Lord Jesus will always address himself to the church, uh, declaring his lordship over it. And he kind of will often, you know, address himself in a semi-unique way to the different churches. And, uh, and the way he addresses himself, we'll kind of actually uh, elaborate that a little bit once we start to work through the text. But he always declares his lordship in some way to the church. Then, after that, the Lord Jesus will highlight where the church had been doing well, if they've been doing well, and he will then also highlight where the church was not doing so well, if they weren't doing so well in a certain area. So he highlights what they're doing good, what they're doing bad, and then thirdly, he will warn them to repent right, from the wickedness that, or the sinfulness that they had been engaged in, and then he will promise a blessing to those who do repent and who will, in fact, uh, pursue obedience. Right? So again, that's the very basic pattern that we see in all seven of the addresses. Right? So the Lord declares his lordship, and then he says, this is what you're doing well, this is what you're not doing so well, uh, therefore shape up, repent of what you're not doing well, and pursue the Lord. And if you do, there's, there's going to be blessings. If you don't, then there's going to be some negative consequences. So that's what we see in all of the seven, and so that's what we're going to look at, and this is going to kind of serve as a basic outline or pattern for these seven churches, including what we're going to look at today. Um, but with that said, one other thing that I will mention very quickly before we actually jump into the text is simply the fact that, um, so we're going to look at Ephesus, the, 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 church, the letter to Ephesus this morning, then next week, Lord willing, we will look at the address to Smyrna, and then to Pergamum, and to Thyatira, and we'll just take one church per week. And we'll work through it like that. And so it's going to take us seven weeks to go through all seven churches. But then after that, what we're going to do on the eighth week, uh, in that sense, we will actually look at all of the churches together, kind of by way of not only review, but also because um, while each of the addresses to the churches individually are unique in and of themselves, and hence we're going to look at them all individually, at the same time, uh, there's actually a, a fair bit of significance when you look at them all together and there's actually some historical and literary significance even to the way you know, the Lord is revealing this to John and the order that is given, the specific order of the churches and the specific language that is used in each of the churches. When you put it all together, there's actually some fascinating uh, things that you miss if you only separate them. But when you put them all together as one big picture, it actually displays something quite fascinating. And we'll look at that more when we get to that, once, once after we've examined all seven. Um, but and, and there's also some language that is, you know, while each of them are unique, there's also some language that is common to every single one of the addresses, and that's also significant in and of, in of itself. So we'll look at that when we get there as well. But for now, the first address is to the church in Ephesus. 
And again, uh, just by way of kind of introduction to this letter itself, just by way of uh, kind of getting the geography in our mind, uh, we looked at this map before, but uh, this is kind of the region that these uh, letters are being addressed to. The city of Jerusalem is way down here. That's the city that's about to be destroyed by the Romans in just a couple of years from now. But this is where all of the seven churches in Asia Minor are, kind of on this uh, area in Asia Minor. This is the Aegean Sea. This is kind of over here in, in Europe now. But uh, the island of Patmos is right here. This is where John is writing from, if you remember. He was exiled there. And then the church in Ephesus is located not so far away on the coast of the Aegean Sea. And if you'll notice, uh, the actual order of all seven of the churches actually kind of goes in order, where it starts down here, Ephesus, and then the next, Smyrna, and then it goes up to Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and then Laodicea. And so the one who is delivering this letter would have just kind of gone in this nice little circuit, and would just kind of, in order, it would have been all structured for him. But anyways, uh, he's, the first one is to the church in Ephesus, and the city of Ephesus at this time, I'm sure as Alex will uh, touch on more in depth, because last week he started his series through Ephesians, and so whenever he preaches, he'll just continue to work through that book. And so we'll probably be learning a lot more details about Ephesus in general. But just a quick little uh, few notes about it. It was considered the most significant city in all of Asia Minor at this time. It boasted a population, some estimate, uh, at, at its kind of peak or at, at its heyday, up to 500,000 people, I read, which even in our modern days is quite a large population. Um, but in the ancient world, this would have been a very massive, massive city. Uh, it was considered the most important as it pertains to things like politics and trade and just overall culture. Uh, you'll notice that it was uh, on the coast of the sea here, which made it ideal for shipping, and it was kind of right on the way to kind of almost anywhere you needed to go. It was kind of, it was the hub of, you know, shipping in that sense. But also, as you can't really see on this map, but uh, it was kind of at the convergence of four different trading routes uh, by the Romans as well. So basically, if you had to go anywhere in this vicinity, it would lead you through Ephesus. And so people were constantly going in and out of Ephesus all the time. And so it was a very active uh, city and a very impressive city. And uh, actually one of the seven wonders of the ancient world is located in Ephesus, and that is the temple to the false god Artemis, or Diana, uh, as it is in Roman. And so, all that to say, very, very impressive city. In Acts chapter 19, we learned that the Apostle Paul was the one who founded the church in the city of Ephesus, and he ministered there for a period of three years. And the letter that he writes to Ephesus, the book of Ephesians, was written to that church uh, in this city. Right? So that's just a, a few bit of notes about it in general. There's obviously a lot more we can say about it, but that'll suffice for now. And so with that in mind, then kind of going back to this basic outline that we're going to look at regarding all of the churches, we begin with Christ's lordship declared over this church, which we see in chapter 2, verse 1. It says this, To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, and who walks among the seven golden lampstands. So that is the Lord Jesus' address to the church right off the bat. And a, a quick note about this, when it says it is to the angel of the church in Ephesus, uh, we noted this two weeks ago, that when we hear the word angel in Scripture, uh, we often think of the heavenly celestial beings all right, who do the bidding of God at various times, and that would be right because that is often how the word angel is in fact used, right? referring to those heavenly beings. But we also noted that the word angel is often used of human messengers as well, people who just carry messages, because the word angel literally means messenger. And so we looked at a variety of examples of how the prophets in the Old Testament would often be called angels, because they were declaring God's message. And therefore, it was our argument that when Revelation refers to the angel of such and such a church, which it will for all, all of the churches, we are arguing that it is the, the pastor slash elders of that particular congregation. So he's saying to the pastor and elders of Ephesus. Right? That's who he's addressing this letter to. And then, again, the Lord Jesus identifies himself. He is the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand and who walks amongst the seven golden lampstands. Now, this language, you may recall, was what we had heard from chapter 1. Uh, and in fact, this is something I'll note that when the Lord addresses himself to all of the seven churches, uh, he always describes himself with language that was already used back in chapter 1. So if you remember in chapter 1, when John was given the revelation of Jesus, uh, we were, he was described in great 
spectacular ways, right? With all of his splendor and majesty. He had, you know, face shining like the sun at full strength, eyes like flaming fire, feet like burnished bronze, a golden sash around his chest, right? He's, he's described in very grand ways. And, uh, and one of the ways he was described as holding seven stars in his right hand and walking amongst the seven golden lampstands. And so using that language that we already saw in verse chapter one, right, is now used here in the address to Ephesus. And will you see other descriptions Again, as we go on to look at the other churches. But again, all of this is to say that the Lord Jesus is now personally addressing the church in Ephesus, and he is the Lord of it. Which brings us already to the second part of the outline, and that is the part where the Lord now is going to highlight where the church is doing well or where it's not doing so well. We see that uh, first in chapter 2, or verse 2 and 3, where he describes how they're doing well. He says this, I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance. And how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be false. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary. Alright, so this is Christ's commendation of the Ephesian church. And uh, the actual commendation itself, you'll notice as I point out here, is actually kind of in somewhat of a rhyming fashion, uh, namely, he points out that they have been toiling very well, and yet they have not been growing weary. And it's interesting that the word that he uses for toil in the Greek is actually almost essentially the same root word for weariness. So it's almost like a play on words where he's saying you're, you're, you're wearying yourself out, and yet you're not growing weary. He says you are patiently enduring, and you are enduring patiently. And he says, you cannot bear with those who are evil, but you are bearing up for my name's sake. So again, he's kind of using this rhymy fashion to describe what the church had been doing well. And in pertaining to not bearing with those who are evil, he actually provides a specific example of what he means. And he says that they have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and have found them to be false. So apparently, in the church in Ephesus at this time, there were people, professing Christians even, who would work their way through the city and they would then come to the church and they were claiming this title of apostle. And as also Alex pointed out last week, the office of title, or um, the office of apostle in the first century was a very unique office in and itself. It was essentially the highest rank in the early church. And the Lord Jesus only appointed uh, a few men to be apostles. So the twelve disciples were also uh, named apostles by the Lord Jesus. Uh, there were some other men who were very closely linked to these uh, twelve disciples, like Barnabas and James and Apollos, who were sometimes also called apostles in Scripture. And then you've got the Apostle Paul, who was, again, kind of you know, appointed an apostle a little later on by the Lord Jesus himself on the road to Damascus. And uh, he was kind of designated the apostle to the Gentiles. And so he was kind of unique in that sense as well. But again, there weren't hundreds of apostles running around in the first century. And there's no apostles yet today. The office has been closed and it's done. Uh, but there was only a couple in the ancient world, and uh, one of the things that the apostles did, and which made them unique amongst other things, was that they were given true authority from the Lord Jesus to then speak on his behalf in the, to kind of lay the foundation of the early church. This is one of the things they did, and that's why a lot of the apostles' writings is what we now have as divinely inspired scripture, because their teaching is authoritative. Right? So, all that to say, in the case of the Ephesian church, there were these guys who were coming along to the church, and they were saying, we're, we're apostles. We've been, we've been appointed by Christ to, uh, to be in this office. Right? So, in light of that, that would have been a big deal, because if these guys really are apostles, well then, you have to listen to what they're saying. They're, they're authoritative. But, in this case, it says they tested these guys, and they found them to be false. Now, we're not given the specifics of what this testing necessarily looked like. Um, it's possible that, you know, they, they aligned what these guys were saying with what the Apostle Paul had perhaps already said. So remember, the Apostle Paul was the one who founded the church. He ministered there for three years. And so they probably are, are well acquainted with the Apostle Paul, and they might have contradicted in their message. Or it's possible that these guys just simply contradicted the scriptures in general, right? And so, whatever the case was, right, okay, they're testing them and they say, okay, these guys are phonies, these guys are not apostles, no way. And uh, this was good, right? So they're being very discerning in this regard, and the Lord Jesus commends them for this. Um, and not only that, but pertaining to this idea of discerning, uh, if you go down to 
Uh, oh, actually, no, first off, what's actually fascinating uh, regarding why uh, the, the, it's interesting that the Ephesian church was in fact known for this discernment and the ability to snip out these false apostles because this was actually one of the final things that the Apostle Paul warned them to do and to be careful of before he left. So if you remember, going back to Acts chapter 20, which I have on the slide here, um, in Acts chapter 20, the Apostle Paul was actually on his way back to Jerusalem on one occasion, but he stops near the Ephesian church, which had only been founded, and he, the Ephesian elders come down, and he gives them one final address, and he's not really going to see them again after this. And he says many things to them, but he says specifically at one point, he says, pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves will arise men, speaking twisted things, to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore, be alert. Right? That was the warning that Paul gave to the Ephesian church. Be alert. There's going to be people who come from your own selves. They're going to be claiming to be Christians. They're going to, you know, that's what they're going to claim to be, but they're going to be speaking twisted things to try and draw away the disciples. They're going to be wolves in sheep's clothing. And so be on the alert, right? Don't let these guys invade. That was the final warning. And so it's interesting that that was the final thing Paul says to them. And then when we look at, you know, their status over the book of Revelation, that's exactly what they're being known for, right? The guys, are, the false apostles are coming in. They're not giving them the time of day. They're just, they're testing them. They're being very discerning. So again, that's all very good. And then another example of this is actually, if you jump over to verse 6, or down to verse 6, it says uh, that Christ further commends them for hating the works of the Nicolaitans, which he also hated. Right? So, there's, you know, whether it's the false apostles or this group called the Nicolaitans, again, the, the Ephesian church was being very discerning in not submitting themselves to these guys. Now, the Nicolaitans were not really sure exactly what these people were. Um, it's probably, you know, some sort of uh, sect of, you know, they would have, they would have, what it likely was, what most commentators suggest, is that this was, in fact, a subgroup of, they called themselves Christians. They, they identified uh, as Christians. Uh, we don't know any very much about them. The only other time they're mentioned is over in chapter 2, verse 15, so just a couple of verses later, in the address to the church at Pergamum. Uh, but not much is said about them there either, except at that point, in chapter 2, verse 14, they are mentioned in connection to the idea of offering food to idols and to sexual immorality. And so from that, what is possible is that this is a group of professing Christians who were nevertheless actually seducing people into idolatry and sexual immorality. And they might have been doing it under the guise of Christian liberty. So they might have been saying, now that Jesus has died on the cross and paid for all of our sins, we are free to do anything we want, right? We're, we're free in Christ. And so if you want to, you know, commit sexual immorality, you can do that. Jesus will forgive you. And if you want to offer those, you know, food to those idols, you can do that. Jesus has forgiven you. And so you can do whatever you want now. It's very possible that this is exactly what the Nicolaitans were preaching. And Jesus says, I hate that, right? That's absolutely garbage. And he says, the Ephesian church hates it. And he commends the Ephesian church for hating along with him. He says, you guys hate that? That's good, right? I hate that too, and so that's, that's well and, and good. Uh, he does not say, now guys, right, Ephesian church, just, you know, get, be a little more patient with these guys. You don't want to be too judgmental at this point. You might drive them away. Um, you know, it's not very winsome to hate their works. Uh, you know, maybe you should just be a little, he doesn't do any of that stuff. No, he says, you hate it, that's good. Keep hating what they're doing. And that just goes to show, again, even in our culture today, that there are wicked sins, right? That we should hate, all right? Abortion, sodomy, fornication, just general lawlessness, theft, lying, just all of the commandments of God, all of that which the Lord has called us to do, wickedness, sinfulness, going away from that, are in fact things that we should hate. We should hate those kind of sins, right? The Ephesian church hated the works of the Nicolaitans, and they're commended for it. Right? So again, all of this is very good on their part. The Lord is commending them. But then we do get to verse 4, which says this, But I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love that you had at first. Right? So they were sound in their doctrine. They had, they, they had been steadfast in their endurance. They were toiling uh, they properly hated wickedness. They were not bearing with evil men. 
this was all good, right, on their part, but they had nevertheless begun, it says, to abandon the love that they had at first. And when it says they abandoned the love, again, we're not actually given all of the specifics of what this necessarily looked like. Uh, this could refer to their love for the Lord himself, could refer to love for one another within the congregation, or as more likely, it probably refers to both, because of the fact that love for God and love for one another is so intimately connected in Scripture, you can't really have one without the other. And so ultimately, uh, they were orthodox in their beliefs, but they weren't very loving in their practice. That, that seems to be the case in this Ephesian church. Now again, we're not given the specific details of what this lack of love looked like. So he says, you've abandoned the love you had at first because you're doing this, or because you weren't doing this. It doesn't give us those details, but uh, one way or the other, they were, they were, this was their one rebuke, a lack of love. Now, with that said, I think it's important to note at this, at this time that uh, there are some you know, contemporary readers who will read a passage like this, and they will they'll read Ephesus' uh, condition here, and they will come to them the wrong conclusion that the reason they lacked love was because they were so emphasizing doctrine and theology. Right? You guys are so emphasis on you know orthodoxy and trying to have all of your practices and you know all of your beliefs in order, and because you guys put such an emphasis on that, that's why you guys lack love. Right? That is what some people will argue, but that's actually not the case. Uh, but on the contrary, we must not forget that it was actually precisely because of their rigorous devotion to orthodoxy that Christ commended them in verse 2 and 3. Right? He's already commended them for that. He said, no, that part was good. You guys had the right beliefs. You guys were believing the right things. You weren't putting up with wrong things. That part was good. Right? So don't stop doing that. Uh, again, the rebuke is for a lack of love, not for too much emphasis on theology and doctrine. And so we must never have this false notion in our head that if you're going to be doctrinal, well, then that means that you're probably going to lack love. And if you're going to be all about the love, that means you're probably going to have to sacrifice doctrine. And it's just, it's a silly, you know, it's not one or the other, but it's a matter of having both. We should be striving to obviously have both, not one or the other. Um, but unfortunately, a lot of churches and a lot of Christians will sometimes, you know, drift into only one or the other, as was the case here in Ephesus. They're drifting into just kind of only doctrine and theology, lacking love. Uh, one way I've heard it put um, is that truth and doctrine and theology is like your skeleton in your body. It's hard, it's rigid, it's unyielding. And then love is like the muscle and the skin that covers the bones. Right? Again, emphasizing that we need both. Right? We can't just be the skeleton rat in the science classroom. Right? All of the bones are in place. It's all you know, right you know, anatomically, but there's no flesh on it. It's not alive. Right? But then again, we can't just be a pile of you know, nothing but uh, skin and muscle right? without any skeleton because that's not alive either. And so, again, obviously we need to be both combined. Um, but in the case of Ephesus, they're kind of leaning towards the skeleton rat at this point. And so, with that said, that brings us already then to the warnings slash blessings. They've been told what they're doing good. They've been told where they're not doing good. So, what is the warning? Verse um, 5, it says this. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. Repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. Right, so there is the exhortation and the warning. Very simply, he says, now remember from where you have fallen, repent, and that repentance is going to look like you doing the works you did at first. Right, so again, very straightforward. This implies they had been you know, good in their orthodoxy and practice at one point, but over the course of time, they've slowly drifted in their practical love for one another. And, uh, and so he says, guys, remember what you guys used to do, right? And then repent and go back to doing that type of stuff, right? Uh, that's the exhortation. That's the command. Very straightforward. Now, as many commentators point out, it's actually fascinating that the Lord Jesus, in this exhortation, in like going back to the works you did at first, and, and you know, that kind of language, uh, may very well actually be drawing on an illustration of something that was actually happening in the first century in the city of Ephesus itself. Uh, and that uh, instance is actually, if you look again here, this is a map, this is a different map than what we've looked at before, kind of more of a topographical map. Um, but it's a good one because it goes, it zooms in a little bit more on the area, and we already noted that Ephesus was located on the coast, 
But what this map shows, helpfully, is that it's actually kind of on this, like, in, you know, it's not like, you know, this is the open sea here, but it's kind of in this uh, little inlet area here. It's actually the mouth of the, right, that's Ephesus, it's on the mouth of the Caister River, right? This is the Caister River right here. And it runs west into the mouth of the harbor area right where Ephesus is. And what's fascinating about this is that the Caister River was actually notorious, and still is, I believe, uh, of bringing large amounts of silt and sand and mud and debris and pebbles and rocks, like large quantities, flow from the river right into the harbor. So much so that even in the ancient world, the harbor would literally begin to get filled up and it would begin to be turned into more of a marsh than an actual harbor. And this was, you know, a significant issue because it would literally begin to cut Ephesus off from the sea. And if they are being cut off from the sea, that would remove their status as a seaport and thus destroy their entire economy. And so this was a, this was a major problem. And uh, it was actually such a problem that about 200 years prior to these events, in the 200s BC, the citizens of Ephesus had actually uh, undergone a major uh, construction project where they dredged the harbor, right? I don't know, I'm not even going to look into how they would have done that in their ancient ways with their ancient tools. But they were able to dredge, you know, the harbor and remove massive amounts of mud and rocks and debris and everything else that was cluttering the harbor and thus securing the, the harbor and their status as a city for many, many years. Um, but, again, the, the river kept flowing, and so over the course of a couple hundred years, by the time we're writing here in the first century, the harbor had actually begun to get filled up with all of that debris again. So it was beginning to be filled and polluted. And so, the, the idea is they would have to, you know, they would have to go back to do the works that they had done at the first in order to remove all of that junk once again which they did, and thus maintained their status as a city for many years to come. But it's from this very illustration that was literally happening at the time of this writing that, again, Jesus may in fact be referring to this instance to make his point. Right? The, the, the church in Ephesus, just like the city of Ephesus, right, over the course of time had become polluted, in the church's case with a lack of love, in the city's case with a full harbor of stuff that wasn't supposed to be there. And so if they wanted to you know, maintain their status as a city or maintain their status as a church, they would have to go back to do the works they had done at first, which would take a lot of toil and effort, but they would have to dredge all of that junk out of there in order to maintain their status. Right? So that is very likely what the Lord is appealing to. And uh, by the way, uh, like I said, the, the city of Ephesus dredged it again, but then over the course of a couple hundred years, it started to get full again, and over the course of time, they just stopped dredging it. Right? They just they didn't do it anymore. And thus, the, 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 the harbor was actually basically filled up. So that if you go to Ephesus now, it's not a city anymore. It's actually a ruins. It's like a tourist destination. You go there and you see all of the ruins of Ephesus. This once thriving city is a ghost town. Nobody lives there. In fact, you wouldn't even be able to tell that it's a harbor, right? It's, it looks more like a grassy plain. It's about five or six miles away from the harbor now. It's been so filled up with stuff. And thus, just again, going to show the consequences of not maintaining the works that you had done at the start. And so this is the call to the Ephesian church, right? If you want to maintain your status as a church, go back to the works you had done at the first, namely love. Now, when they do that, going back to our text, it's interesting that the exhortation specifically is to do the works that you did at first, right? So their problem was a lack of love. And so the solution, Jesus says, is now go back to the works that you had once done. Thus, again, showing uh, quite plainly that uh, works is how love is in fact displayed. That's how it's manifested, right? True love is always displayed in true works. Uh, as the Apostle John would even say elsewhere in his uh, letter of 1 John chapter 5, verse 2 and 3, he says, By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and obey His commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not burdensome. So he says, how do we know if we have love for God? How do we know if we have love for the children of God? How do we know if we're truly loving them? He answers, you'll know if you're actually obeying the commandments of God. Obedience to the commands of God is how you love God and how you love one another. And so what, again, this implies is that in the Ephesian church, they knew all of the right doctrines, they knew all of the right theology, and they were even able to defend these doctrines and these theologies against those who would try to pollute it. Right? And that was all good and well. Again, the Lord Jesus commends them for that. Uh, but then in other areas, they were seemingly not applying it very well. It didn't seem to be actually manifesting itself out in practical works of love for each other. And so what this perhaps looked like 
in a nutshell, was that they were really good at defending the perimeters from the wolves. And that's very necessary. You need to do that. Um, but then, they didn't have very much practical love for the sheep inside. They were all about, let's not make sure the wolves get in here, let, again, important, but then care for the sheep, you know, nurture the sheep. They didn't seem to be doing that part. And this was a serious enough thing that Christ again warns in our text, going back to it, that if, he does, if they do not repent, he will come and remove their lampstand, right? Which is another way of saying, you know, I will remove your status as a church. I will snuff you out. You will die as a church. Your church will die, he says, if you do not start loving one another. Right? It's ultimately, again, it's, it's very fascinating that they have all of the right doctrine, right? They're, they're, you, know, you could go to their website, as it were, and it's, it's all there. It's all sound. But their lack of love for one another warranted the death of a church if they did not repent and go back to the works they had done at first. And so this is a very, very severe warning, but it is the warning nonetheless. But it's not only that, we also then go on to see that he doesn't just leave it at the warning, but he also then provides a promise. He says in verse 7, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. All right, so here a promise is made, it says, to those who will conquer. And uh, this, this idea of conquering is going to be something that we examine a lot uh, in the book of Revelation. It's a major theme. And in fact, as I mentioned at the very start of our time, there are certain things that are unique to every single one of the churches, and this idea of conquering is one of them. Right? He, Jesus says this to every single one of them, right? to the one who conquers, to the one who conquers, to the one who conquers. Every single church has that addressed in it. And so, clearly from this, we see that it is the expectation slash commission of the Lord Jesus that churches conquer, right? That they not simply retreat and, okay, you guys, the world does what they do out there. We'll just stick to ourselves in here. We won't ever try to mingle, right? We won't get engaged in politics or economics or the marketplace or anything like that. We're not going to do that. That's not our place. We're just going to stay over here. That's simply not the idea that we get from Scripture. The church is called to go forth and to conquer the world. Um, and again, we're going to look at that idea more and more as we, as we go through Revelation. But one thing that I will note here that is fascinating is that, again, in this command to conquer, the Lord Jesus may in fact be using another play on words, which we don't actually see in English, but it is there in the Greek. So uh, in verse 6, which I don't have on the slide, but in verse 6, that was the passage or the verse where the Lord said that, you know, you hate the work of the Nicolaitans, which he also hates. And that was good. Now, the word Nicolaitans in the Greek is Nicolaites, Nicolaites, right? And, um, and that's just how, that's, the, what, that's what the word looks like, you know, in English. And then the word conquer, fascinatingly, is the word nikao, right? That's, that's, how, that's what the word is. And so you can see that they actually come from the same root word in Greek. So the word Nicolaitans actually basically means to conquer or to overcome. And so, again, there's almost this play of words where he's saying the Nicolaitans, the overcomers, the conquerors, they're trying to conquer you, but you, he says, are to conquer them, right? That's what you're supposed to do, and this is not the last time he's going to bring something like this up, but that's the point, right? And this is going to be true, again, of every church in every age, doesn't matter where you are or what time period you're in. The devil is always going to have his group of Nicolaitans, right? They, they might not always call themselves Nicolaitans, but they're always going to be there. And they're going to always be trying to conquer the church and overcome it and pollute it in some fashion. And the command of the church then is always to not let them do that, but rather you overcome them. They don't push you back. You actually push them back and conquer. You colonize, you take dominion, you drive the enemy away. And that's the call of every single church. And that's what the Lord Jesus is saying to the church in Ephesus here. And when we do that, by God's grace, he says, to the one who does in fact conquer, again, he is granted to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. It's a glorious promise. And it's obviously a call back to the tree of life in the Garden of Eden that was mentioned in the book of Genesis. Uh, the tree that Adam and Eve were actually specifically barred from eating after they sinned and you know, had the fall uh, occur. They were actually exiled from Eden specifically so that they can't get to that tree anymore. Right? It was just off limits, no more. And now amazingly, the Lord Jesus says... Through faith in him, which is evidenced in the fruit of conquering, you actually get to come and eat of that tree, which had been banished for them for so long. You get to come and eat, right? <laughs> which again is absolutely glorious. 
And it's not just a future reality uh, in like another otherworldly sort of reality, but this is actually something, amazingly, that we've already been able to sort of taste the first fruits of through our salvation in Christ. If we have, by grace, through faith in Jesus alone, been saved, right? If we've been given eternal life, then this is, you know, this is the evidence that we've then gotten to taste the first fruits of the tree of life. And so this is glorious, and this is a great, great promise that he gives to those who conquer and those who do not compromise and capitulate. So, with all that said, bringing all of that into, together by way of summary, we see in this address to the church in Ephesus that Christ is the one who walks amongst the seven golden lampstands and holds the seven golden stars. He is the Lord of the church. He commends the Ephesian church for their toil and their patient endurance and their defending of the faith against false teachers and for hating wickedness. This was very, very good on their part. But they also had to be rebuked for their lack of love. They weren't displaying it very practically for one another in their works for the sheep. Uh, and so, therefore, they are, they are exhorted, they are uh, called to remember and repent and thus conquer. If they did, it says, they would be granted to eat of the tree of life. And if they did not, then Christ would come in judgment and remove their lampstand and they'd be snuffed out as a church. Right? That is the address to the Ephesian church. And therefore, in light of all of that, by way of conclusion and by way of application, uh, what I would simply commend to us is to learn from the Ephesian church. That's going to basically be the application of every single address to the churches. What we're going to do is we're going to look at what they did well, and by God's grace, seek to imitate that in faith. And then look at what they did not do well, and then in faith, say, let's not make those same mistakes. That's basically what we're going to do. And so in the case of the Ephesian church, as I have it written up here, let us strive in faith to, be, uh, to have both a commitment to truth and love. Right? Truth and love. And let us be wary of drifting into only one or the other, as was the case of the Ephesian church here. And uh, so when, it, when we say let us defend truth, let us have a commitment to it, this means that we will defend the faith with endurance and with unyielding tenacity against false teaching and false teachers and you know, false practices and the works of the Nicolaitans, as it were, and the works of the false apostles. We will, we will hold definitely to the word of God and we simply won't budge an inch. We're not even going to give them a sliver of a foothold to you know, get their way inside and so as to pollute things up. Right? We have to be just unyielding in that regard. Which again is very important in our culture because that's something that's going to constantly be happening. Uh, and, and we see, again, unfortunately, many denominations, many Christians, many churches, you know, begin to drift into liberalism. They begin to adopt, you know, homosexuality. They begin to adopt wokeism. They begin to adopt CRT and all of these other, you know, just bad things. These sinful, sinful, wicked things which only serves to crumble the church at its foundations. But many denominations and churches are embracing these things. And ironically enough, they're doing it in the name of love for these groups. And we do not want to do that. In fact, as a church, we should even be known for how much we hate these sins. Right? This is not something to be embarrassed about. Um, many times, you know, if you do emphasize how much you hate certain sins, the culture will sometimes try to label you then as a hater or as a bigot of such groups. And then a lot of times, you know, you know, well-meaning Christians will sort of backpedal because they don't want, well, no, no, I'm not a hater. And, I'm a, and then they'll begin to apologize for everything that they've basically just said. And what I'm saying is don't do that, right? Don't, don't be embarrassed or ashamed to say how much you do, in fact, hate sin. You don't have to, you don't have to do that. Uh, I don't know how much you've seen it, but there's been times where I've seen, you know, professing Christians, and I say it like that because I don't believe that they're true Christians oftentimes. But there are these celebrity pastors who will, you know, go on Oprah or something like that, and if Oprah's commending you, then that's already a bad sign. That would be a red flag right there. But they'll go on there, and obviously if they go on some big talk show, they're going to be asked all of the hot topic, topic issues. So what do you think about homosexuality? What do you think about abortion? What do you think about this and that and this? And usually in their, you know, you know, weaselly way of getting around it, they'll, they'll say things like this, and I've heard this in interviews, like, well, you know, as a Christian, I don't, I don't want to be known for what I'm against. I want to be known for what I'm for, and I'm for love, and I'm for compassion, and I'm for, and I'm for Jesus, right? And they'll say things like that, and it's just their, again, weaselly way of getting around the question so they don't have to answer it. Um, and it's just silly, right? As Christians, we shouldn't be ashamed of what we're known for being against. And obviously, we want to be known for what we're for, too. It's, it's a matter of both, again. And so, 
he, Jesus literally says, you hate the works of the Nicolaitans, I hate them too, that's good, right? And so, let it be known that we shouldn't have to be embarrassed about that, about, you know, a lot of the sins in our culture. Um, but then again, obviously, going to the second part, we must combine that with a genuine love for the saints in practical action towards one another, right? We, we must be always guarding ourselves from growing slack in it so that we're not only ever just biting at the wolves, which we should do, but that we're also protecting and, and caring for the sheep in actual practical ways. And so in other words, our knowledge of doctrine must flow out of our fingertips into practical displays of love towards one another. And if it's not, then something is wrong with our theology and doctrine. Right? right doctrine always leads to right practice. So if right practice is not happening, something is polluted upstream in the doctrine. Right? They always have to go together. Or as we read in 1 Corinthians 13 this morning, right? we can have all knowledge, we can have all understanding, we can speak with tongues of angels and be able to have, remove mountains with our faith. But he says, if you don't have love, and it's not displaying itself in practical love for one another, then you're just a noisy gong and a clanging cymbal. In other words, you're just very annoying. That's what that is. Uh, loveless orthodoxy makes us like the priest and the Levite in Jesus' parable of the Good Samaritan. Right? The man who was beaten and left for dead. The priest walks by, sees him, doesn't do anything. The Levite walks by, sees him, doesn't do anything. They both would have had the right theology. They knew all of the answers. But it didn't display itself in practical action in actually helping the man who was in desperate need of help. So there was a disconnect there, and that is what we do not want to be our case as a church, or as a family, or as Christian individuals. We want to have both. We want to strive and toil tirelessly with patient endurance to defend the truth of Christianity from the errors and corruption of our society, and we want to then display practical love for one another. And lastly, just by way of being super practical, that these practical displays of love for one another will often be very basic, behind the scenes, nothing seemingly flashy about it. It might take the form of just helping a neighbor with a project that you know they need help with. It might mean that you have a fellow church member over for dinner and dessert, or you bring a meal to them. It might mean that you just take some time to play a game with your children, or read a book to your children or your grandchildren, or do a project with them that you know that they've been wanting to do. It might mean that you teach somebody just a practical skill. It might mean that you write a letter to somebody, or call somebody that you know that would mean a lot to. Right? It can take a whole bunch of forms, but that's the point, right? You, we, we know all the right answer, or you know, to strive to have the right theology, and then live it out in practical, behind the scenes, nothing flashy kind of ways in that sense. These are the things that we learned from the church in Ephesus. So let's pray. Father God, we do praise you and we thank you for your word and in light of uh, everything we just looked at from this text, we're asking, as we so often do, that you would make our hearts like the good soil in your parable, that it would now receive this word and it would apply it to our hearts in faith, that uh, you would, by the power of the Holy Spirit, help us to strive to have the right theology and the right doctrine and that we would be unyielding in it and that we would uh, even be willing to die for it if it came to that, Lord. Give us that kind of commitment against the errors of our culture. But Lord, also then help us to combine that with uh, a genuine love for the saints and a genuine practical display of love, even, even if it costs you know, sacrifice on our part and, and various inconveniences on our part at times. Help us, Lord, to be committed to both truth and to love. And Lord, guard our hearts from being like the pathway soil, which hears your word, but uh, it's hard and just doesn't accept it or receive it. Guard our hearts from being like the stony soil, which hears it and is very excited for a while, but then it just falls away when things get hard and the heat is turned up. And Lord, do guard us from also being like the thorny soil, which hears your word and it might take root a little bit, but the cares of this world quickly choke it out and it becomes unfruitful. Lord, help us not to be like any of the unfruitful soils, but to be good soil, so that by your grace we would produce a blessed harvest of righteousness, 60, 80, and 100 fold from our lives. As a church, Lord, we're praying for this blessing in the good name of Christ. Amen. The charge for this morning is this, and again, it's a rehash of everything we looked at from our text. To toil, to know the truth, and to defend the truth of Scripture, even if it means going right to your death. But then also, simultaneously, being diligent in showing this doctrine through practical works of love for one another within the body. Because when we combine these two things, truth and love, this is what the Lord uses to then go out and conquer the world. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself, the God and 
and God and our Father, who loved us and gave us eternal comfort and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish them in every good work and word. Amen.